Yes, that reminds me of the time when Brian and I were standing knee deep in the amber waters of the river Ganges, elbow to elbow with the fishwives of New Delhi, learning that gentle art of river laundering, putting the last minute spit shine on a pair of baby blue boxer shorts. And I remember watching that slow parade of boats pass by me on that never ending river at sunset and him asking me, where to next? <laughs> and I said, I am grateful to sat in this port of call for as long as I have. But Brian, for me, the horizon will always be just a bit out of reach. And that is why I continue to sail. But I wish you an extraordinary life. Hi there, I'm John O'Hurley and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Hello Alfred. Alfred marries powerful technology with excellent service to keep your home running smoothly. If you're tired of spending your weekends cleaning, doing laundry and grocery shopping, you need to try this on-demand service. Dedicated, trusted Alfred home managers coordinate and take care of time-consuming tasks and chores so you can focus on what you love. Visit helloalfred.com forward slash behind the brand. And now let's get into our episode. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here in the home of John O'Hurley. John, thanks for having us. Thank you. Nice to be here. I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? But, you know, at the age of three, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I, uh, people would uh, ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up. Very simply, I would point to the black and white television in the corner of the room, and I would say, well, I'm, I, I am an actor, so that's what I'm going to be. You and it's that. not that I wanted to be an actor. It's that I was an actor. I already knew. You knew at age three? At age three. Every moment of my life after that was justifying that initial dream that I had. And, uh, you know, whether I was a, a, a kid in, uh, doing plays in the basement for my parents or uh, in, in high school doing plays there. Or, I was always doing something theatrical because that's what I knew. I, that's, I defined myself as an actor. How did you get that inspiration? Where did that come from? I, I don't know. I honestly don't. I don't know why some kids can sit down at a piano and, and, and are instant virtuosos at, at the age of four and five. I don't know what, what, you know, what genetic uh, lineage uh, there is, but uh, for some reason, for me, I was an actor, and I always was, and I always knew that I was going to be one. And so it was a very, for me, it was just a case of connecting the dots. And that was the difficult part because I also developed an over, an, I had an overdeveloped sense of stage fright. It, it would be like being a very good surgeon with the shakes. So consequently for me, it was always getting over myself. Uh, and so that was, a, that was the difficult part, especially early on in my career, even the professional side of my career. Were your parents uh, supportive of that decision? Not particularly. Uh, and and, and, and it, probably it, rightly so, because, uh, you know, it's the type of business, if you can talk yourself out of it, if somebody else can talk you out of it, you really should. It's a very dangerous business. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a business built for success. Uh, the deck is always stacked against you. The number of people that make it in entertainment is so abysmally small. Uh, and, uh, and, and so to be a success in entertainment really requires an awful lot of luck, but an awful lot of preparation, and hopefully the two join at some point. Yeah, I want to unpack that a little bit in just a second. I want to go back to your parents. So what did your parents want you to be? Uh, what was like their backup plan for you if you didn't, if this acting thing didn't pan out? Well, I was lucky enough to grow up in, uh, around um, wealthy, not wealthy, but upper middle class, but very successful people. The people, the, the, the parents of the friends that I had, they were CEOs, lawyers, doctors. Uh, they were successful people. So I grew up around uh, with examples of success. So to be a success was easier for me because I had examples of it. For someone who grows up around people that have, you know, kind of, you know, swung from the middle rung on the ladder of life and really don't, haven't tried to do anything great with their lives, it's much more difficult. It's much more difficult to live a life if you don't have examples of success. And I was blessed because I had them. So let's go back to that stage fright thing. How did you eventually work through that? I mean, were you the kid that was tried out for all the school plays and then you, you got there and you had to work through, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, throwing I, up? Or... Uh, you know, I was too afraid to audition for the school plays. Um, it took an English teacher one afternoon after reading in class a play, uh, and he held me after class and he said, you read very well today. He said, what I'd like you to do is get down to the theater department and, and, tell, uh, and tell him that I sent you down and uh, that you should audition. And uh, I did that, and I auditioned, and I ended up with the lead in the first play that I auditioned for. Um, 
but it, it wasn't without a great sense of trepidation. I remember trying to sleep the night before and it was like this. I was so nervous. And the trouble was it just meant too much. And that's the problem is that when you, one side of the brain is, is blessed with this kind of image of where you know you're supposed to go, and then you have the other side of the brain that actually has to connect the dots. Um, it's overwhelming for that side of the brain because it's like the pressure put on that side of the brain uh, is pretty intense. So that really was, that's what it was for me. That's what stage fright was for me. It was trying, it, everything meant too much. And I'll tell you how I solved it. I, um, I'd gotten the lead in a play in New York that I had wanted to do all of my young adult life. It was a two-person play called Mass Appeal. And I remember going out to opening night for that. And I remember sitting in, uh, on the train that night, thinking to myself how nervous I was. And I said, this is absolutely ridiculous. I'm sitting here ready to throw up on a train. And this is my chosen career. And this is how I'm going to live my life. For the rest of my life, I'm going to be living in this kind of tension. I said, this doesn't work. So I had to rethink. And I said, you know, I've always believed that if you want to change your feelings, you change your thoughts. And so I said, I've got to think differently. So I said, tonight, I'm willing to throw this role out the window because I'm just going to go out on stage and I'm going to have fun. And that's going to be the only thing I think about. I don't have any feelings. I'm going to think about just having fun. And I thought about that and that's all I thought about. I wouldn't allow another thought into my head. And it worked. And I went out on stage that night and I had fun. And I had a good time, and, but it was, it was an absolute catharsis for me because all of a sudden I understood I can control, I can direct the way that my mind thinks and how I feel by just changing my thoughts. Now, you take that to today, and I walk on stage every single night in my career, whether I'm doing a game show, whether, I am doing, whether I'm on Broadway, doing my one-man show, whatever it is, I say one prayer, and that one prayer is right before I go on stage, I bow my head and I say, God, let me be surprised. And that's it. It calms me, and I know I walk on stage, and I know that everything I have is within me. And I have the ability to handle whatever is going to come at me, improvisationally, spontaneously, or with the, spoken, with the written word that I'm just delivering. It doesn't matter. I have enough to handle it. And it's worked every day for me. And I've done over 2,000 performances as Billy Flynn on Broadway in, uh, in the musical Chicago, the same with King Arthur and Spamalot. And I say the same prayer every night when I go out and do those. That's amazing insight. And, you know, actually you have a lot in common with a lot of these other great minds that I've talked to, whether it's, uh, you know, Tony Robbins, the guru who told me, um, you know, your brain is not designed to make you happy. Happiness is your job. Your brain is designed to keep you safe. <laughs> uh, or author Seth Godin, who talked a lot about the lizard brain or the amygdala, amygdala which is the you know, fight or flight kind of uh, emotion that we feel when we're faced with some sort of uh, decision. Well, I, you know, I, I, before you say that, I, because this is such a fundamental part of the way that I believe, I, I, I don't believe that the mind is set up to protect you. Yes, I think your rational mind is set up to protect you, but there's another part of the mind, which is the imagination. And I think that is there to challenge you. And that was the same thing that spoke to that three-year-old boy in me. It was my imagination. I always saw the pictures in my mind on the television of what I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be there. I could see myself there. So the imagination drives what your direction is. It is constantly, I always say, Always listen to your imagination. Do not listen to your rational mind. Your rational mind will always lie to you. It has the agenda. It has the fight or flight. And it will stop you from doing the things that you should be doing. Because your imagination cannot lie to you. It's a constant review, a constant self-assessment, 24-7. Your imagination never stops self-assessing you. And so it always leads you with the pictures of where you're supposed to be and who you are supposed to be. And I have never stopped listening to my imagination because it has directed me in the most interesting ways in my life. It's the reason that I compose. It's the reason that I write books. It's the reason that I speak to corporations. It's the reason that I'm an actor. It's the reason that I host game shows. It's the reason that I've done everything in my life because my imagination told me to. It told me to dance, Dancing with the Stars. That's awesome. Uh, very inspiring. I love all that. Um, gosh, there's so many directions I'd like to take this. Um, 
let's go uh, get a little bit personal. Mm -hmm. So you're a father, mm -hmm. um, and you have a son. Mm -hmm. And so are you giving him that same kind of advice? And if so, does he have the same sort of DNA, the makeup, that hard wiring of being able to know that vision? And if so, awesome. But if not, maybe for the rest of us, who, if not, maybe for the rest of us uh, who are still trying to figure it out, what advice would you give about you know, figuring out what your passion is or what that vision is? How do we develop that or cultivate that if, we don't, if we're not born with it at age three? Uh, I believe that you activate the imagination through what I call stillness, through contemplation, through living in the present moment. Um, because you have no sense of what is going on in the world genuinely at any one moment unless you are still. If I'm constantly concerned about the past or constantly concerned about the future, I have no idea that I'm sitting here talking to you. Now, in that moment is where my imagination works. It doesn't work in the future. It doesn't work in the past. The imagination works in your mind. The inspiration of the imagination comes from when you're sitting in an airplane looking out the window and thinking of nothing. And all of a sudden, the pictures, the recurring pictures of who you are, when you're lying in bed at night, and you have that wonderful moment in between consciousness and, un and that sense of stillness. In that sense of stillness is when the imagination starts to work. So I encourage people to learn to be still as much as they can during a day. And the more that they are still, the more that they will be in touch with their imagination. So are, do you, are you talking about like dedicated meditation where you're deliberately sitting still in a certain place and for a certain amount of time? Or are you just talking about being reflective in the moments that you can be? Yes and yes. I'll find that I will be just as inspired when I'm sitting in a car in the middle of traffic, stuck bumper to bumper on the, on the uh, 405 here in Los Angeles. And all of a sudden, as I'm staring out the window, just ideas occur to me, just concepts occur to me. Things are always going on. My imagination is always working. It's always seeing something. It's always seeing something. So I'm always, I'm always looking to those pictures. And it's the recurring pictures that are the most important because those are the ones you should be doing. It's like your compass, right? It tells you the direction to go. That's a, it's also the boot in the ass. Because it doesn't lie to you. Your imagination can, it doesn't know how to lie to you. All it is is the constant self-assessment of, it's your constant self-assessment. And it knows where you're supposed to be going. And it will always direct you. And it will never direct you in an area that you cannot achieve, which I think is the most important part. It's taking you where you need to go. And I'll say further that whether you believe in God or not, I think it's the only way that God can speak to us is through our imaginations, that these pictures are led there to direct us to the next steps in our lives. And I learned that because years and years ago, an elderly gentleman who I inherited as, uh, as a grandfather of mine, sadly has passed away, um, very successful entrepreneurial man. And I asked him one night, I said, to what do you attribute your success? And he grabbed my arm and he leans over to me and he says, John, you got two choices in life. You can have an ordinary life or you can have an extraordinary life. And that's it. And it has nothing to do with money or power, but it has everything to do with the power of your choices. And I thought about that. And that became for me kind of my GPS for my life. And I thought about living an extraordinary life. And so I began to contemplate and to write about what the nature of living extraordinarily is. And what I came up with were the three common elements to living extraordinarily. And you had to have all three, not two of three or not one of three, all three. And the first is ma imagination. And the second is contemplation. And the third is appreciation. And if you combine the three elements of living by imagination, living by contemplation, and living by appreciation, you have lived an extraordinary life. You, will not be, you may not be the richest person in the world. You may not be the most public person in the world. You can live very privately and at very little means, but still live extraordinarily.